fanciful creation story. In modern times, the completion of a monumental structure is surrounded by pomp and ceremony. Further still, every phase of the construction is usually well documented. But when taking an academic voyage through the Giza pyramids of Egypt and the surrounding monuments, one is struck by the complete absence of commemoration of these structures construction methods and reasoning. Instead of countless depictions of laborers using ramps and pulleys to maneuver large blocks, we find flat, uninscribed walls on the interior of the pyramids. What's more is that archaeologists have yet to dig up even a trace of the building equipment used in the construction of the pyramids. Even more remarkable is that no inscription or depiction anywhere in the land of Egypt so much as mentions mass masses of men, huge blocks, and ramps in regards to the construction of the pyramids. Modern man has done much speculation regarding the reason for the building of the pyramids and the methods used. Experts of our day have suggested that the pyramids were built to be tombs, the eternal resting place of egomaniacal pharaohs. But without so much as a trace of the more practical construction methods, even a skeptical observer would be forced to entertain the theories of the ancient Egyptians regarding their own creations. Those of ancient Egypt are unambiguous about the reasoning and construction methods of the pyramids. They claim that these structures were more like machines that allowed the king to join with the gods after death. They were essentially stargates to the heavens, where one could be transformed into a god. Instead of masses of men dragging large, perfectly cut stones from quarries miles away, the Egyptians say that magicians effortlessly cut and lifted the stones into place. The pyramid texts, the oldest known religious texts, state that the pyramids were built to throw open the doors of the firmament and make a road so that the deceased king might ascend into the company of the gods. The Egyptians also claim that the pyramids were built by magicians who used quote-unquote words of power to effortlessly levitate huge stones. The Mayan pyramids, although thousands of miles away and built thousands of years later, are said to have been built by the same method and for the same purpose as the pyramids in Egypt. The Mayan people of southern Mexico and Guatemala say that their pyramids were built by beings with magical powers and that all they had to do was whistle and the heavy rocks would move into place. The Incan people, far south of the Mayans, claim that the massive stones used to build their great structures was carried through the air to the sound of a trumpet. The Mayan traditions state that their pyramids were where men became gods and the place where gods are made. Curious that these far-flung civilizations would suggest that their pyramids were built the same way and for the same reason. The pyramid, as a symbol of transformation and rebirth, survives to this day. The universe has proven to be quite the onion. Its simple exterior betrays the senses. What science has called truths of the universe is in fact an ever-changing list of theories, each being no more than shades of gray closer to truth than the last. This is not, however, saying that anything but the ultimate truth is useless. Our list of ignorance is great, but our achievements using the half-truths is also great. Our knowledge of an electron, for example, is far from complete, and yet it didn't stop us from harnessing its power and using it as a source of energy and communication. As stated at the beginning of the book, the whole truth requires the mind of God, but it doesn't mean that we can't make application of half-truths. Even this text is nothing more than a long list of half-truths, but, as its author, I'm comforted by the fact that everything else you've ever read is likewise. Even books you believe to be inspired by God are subject to your interpretation, which you could never be 100% sure about.
and can never prove conclusively. No scientist understands this better than quantum physicists. Unlike the elegant equations of Einstein and Newton, these poor bastards are knee-deep in hideous equations that are so hideous they couldn't possibly describe the universe and at best only describe what the universe is likely to do, not what it absolutely will do. Quantum mechanics, or quantum physics, is a branch of physics that concerns itself with the smallest particles and spaces in the universe. As it turns out, the subatomic world is not what we expected. Traditionally, extremely small particles like electrons were thought of as tiny billiard balls bouncing off of each other at mathematically predictable angles. And like billiard balls, their location, direction, and speed could be easily measured. On a subatomic level, particles exhibit strange properties and behavior. Sometimes, particles would seem to disappear and reappear on the other side of a wall that, mathematically speaking, should have been impossible to penetrate. Other times, particles will seem to dance between the state of being a particle and being a wave. And measuring the subatomic world is also difficult. Because in order to measure things like speed, location, and direction, one must build a sensor that interacts with the subatomic particle, thereby changing the course of destiny. Surely these poor scientists are frustrated by particles that always do something different just because they're not watching. It was once a philosophical question as to whether it was possible to break a stone into infinitely small pieces. Scientists and philosophers would speculate over the existence of an elementary particle, a particle that could not be broke apart and represented the fundamental building blocks of the universe. This continued until evidence emerged that the universe was indeed made of unbreakable, fundamental particles, and these particles were called atoms. It would later be discovered that these particles weren't unbreakable, and were in fact composed of even smaller particles, dubbed subatomic, and included the proton, electron, and neutron. Later still, it was discovered that even these particles were in fact composed of even smaller particles called quarks. That appeared to be where the dividing stopped. Regardless of whether these quarks are indeed the smallest particles, scientists have been forced to conclude that the universe is made out of some kind of elementary particle. But the subatomic world wasn't done violating the rational mind of these poor researchers. As it turns out, even the nature of space and time had its peculiarities. Space and time were thought of as mediums that these elementary particles existed in, and up until the beginning of the 20th century, scientists were spared the grief of having to think of time and space as particles. But eventually came the day when scientists were forced to ponder nearly the same question that had plagued them centuries prior. Can time and space be broken into infinitely small parts? Can I nudge an object an infinitely small distance from where it once was? Can I measure the length of time between two events in infinitely small units? Can I break an inch or minute into as many pieces as I want? Do objects glide through space and time, or do they quote unquote tick? After much reluctance, scientists were forced to admit that space and time also existed as elementary units, and these extremely small units were called Planck units. A Planck length represents the smallest length of space any object can move. So instead of particles gliding gracefully through space, they instead tick through space. This means that they essentially disappear and reappear one Planck length ahead in the direction that they were moving. What's more is that the particles also move through time likewise, and so disappear and reappear one Planck time in the future. Adding insult to injury, scientists are still unable to gracefully unify the separate forces of nature, gravity, magnetism, and the nuclear forces. These forces, once exclusively thought of as curves in space, are now spoke of in terms of particles as well, gravitons, photons, etc. Einstein envisioned gravity as no more than a warping in the shape of space that large objects create by their presence alone. Like a bowling ball placed at the center of a trampoline, a marble rolling on the surface of the trampoline will appear to be drawn to the bowling ball. Though it appears that the bowling ball has some kind of gravitational hold on the marble, the marble is only responding to the curvature 